Hello and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz and today is True Crime Tuesday. So today we are going back to the land down under. I swear I'm not obsessed with Australia. I mean, not yet. Fine. I might be becoming obsessed with Australia. They do have some pretty wild true crime cases to talk about, and today's case, well, just wait for it. We're going to talk about another domestic incident today with another very tragic ending. It brings up the question, when is it time to leave someone? Everyone in these cases would like to think that they would know when to get out, but in some cases with some people, you just never really know when they're just going to snap. Unfortunately, when that happens, we have incidences like the one we're going to talk about today. I mean, there's not too many out there like this one. Thank Christ, because Okay, so let's get into it. We're going to start by meeting our couple, John and Catherine. They were both divorced with children of their own. He had two who lived with him, and Catherine had a few children of her own. And when she met John, she was actually in a relationship with another man whose name was also John, and they had a little boy named Eric together. In 1995, things would end with Catherine and her son's father, John, and she would move in with the John she was having an affair with. At this time, she was 39 and he was 40, and at first things were reported to be fairly smooth. His children got on well with her, and although they would fight sometimes, they settled into a life together that seemed to work for them. He was working as a miner, and she was a butcher, and they both really loved their jobs. Three years would pass, and Catherine was starting to kind of put the pressure on John to marry her. Now, John wasn't particularly wanting to get married again. In fact, he ended up telling her just that. He was looking to leave his house and whatever he had when he died to his children. This ended up infuriating Catherine, and as a retaliation, she ended up filming him with some first aid type kits or equipment that he had taken out of the trash at his work. I guess they had expired, but he kind of grabbed them because he thought that they could still be of use to him somehow. So kind of a gray area. I don't know. I mean, technically stealing, even though it was being thrown out. I guess it's always better to just ask in this instance. But anyways, the point is, is that his girlfriend, Catherine, films him with them and sends the film to his boss and his boss fired him for it. Now, John had been at this job for 17 years at this point, and it was his source of financial security, and Catherine just ruined it for him. So, I mean, if he didn't want to marry her before, imagine now. He ended up breaking things off with her and kicking her out of his house. This didn't last, though, because a few months later, the pair would begin kind of an on-again, off-again thing, but John would not allow her to move back into his house this time. Now, John was described as a drinker um, to the point of alcoholism, but regardless, a very hard worker and likable guy. Catherine was not described in quite the same manner, although some people found her very generous and fun, others did not, and when John went back to her, he ended up losing some of his friends. Then we come to February of 2000. The couple is still attempting to work things out, but there is already a lot of strain on this relationship as it looks like they just both want different things from the relationship at this point. During one specifically nasty fight, Catherine would end up stabbing John in the chest, which she would later claim was in self-defense. 
So after this happened, John would go and take a restraining order out on her. And at this point, he had pretty much had enough of her antics. So on February 29th, he got the restraining order granted on his way to work. But then he still went into work like it was a normal day. Then when he got out of work, he went over to his neighbors to have a few drinks, which was his typical routine at that time. Then he came home. His children had been sent to go sleep at their friend's house by Catherine, and she wasn't there, so he just went to bed. He awoke to Catherine in some black lingerie, looking to um, get busy. Um, so the couple has sex and they go back to bed together. John would awake again to Catherine stabbing him in the chest. Now, I don't know why she sent the children away or why he went to work that day like it was a normal day, leaving them in her care, but that night that John took out the restraining order on Catherine, she stabbed him 37 times in the chest, ending his life. He had even told his coworkers that day that if something were to happen to him, that it would have been Catherine. And when he said that, they pleaded with him not to go home to her, but he expressed concerns that she would harm his children if he didn't. So maybe he was just trying to not set her off. It's reported that she was extremely verbally and physically abusive in her relationships, so this would make sense. It seems like although he went and took out this restraining order, he then went through some extreme pains to keep the status quo afterwards. Unfortunately, this ended up costing him his life because although he woke up and fought back and he actually almost escaped from the house, he ended up being pulled back inside and ultimately succumbed to Catherine's attack. And she wasn't finished there because this woman scorned had more plans for John, or at least what was left of John. This is where I feel the need to throw in another viewer discretion as what Catherine does to John's corpse is, let's just say Catherine was a butcher, particularly an abattoir, if I'm pronouncing that right, or boner. She was the person who skinned all the meat from the bones and she loved her job and it was said that she was very good at it. So when John Price didn't show up for work the next day, one of his concerned coworkers and his neighbor decided to see if everything was okay with him. They didn't get too far as right away they noticed blood near the doorway, at which point they called the police. So the police show up at around 8 a.m. and before they even go into the house, they take notice of something curious around the back of the house. There was an odd piece of meat and a plate of food thrown in the backyard. The officers then entered the house through the rear door, which led into the kitchen. Once inside, they noticed what first appeared to be a curtain hanging in the doorway that was between the kitchen and the living room. Once they kind of took in what they were looking at, they realized that this was not a curtain at all, but almost a complete human skin. It was hung from a meat hook by the head portion. John's body was discovered in the living room area, completely skinless and headless. She had positioned his headless, skinless corpse almost in a pose with his legs crossed and then she put a soda bottle in one of his arms. Lying next to him was Catherine Knight, unresponsive, along with a large knife. Police would take her into custody and she would be stabilized. It seemed as though after she finished desecrating John's body, she decided to overdose on pills and lie next to him. 
So in the kitchen, she had two meals set up, similar to the one that the officers found in the backyard. The meals each had two pieces of meat, baked pumpkin, baked potatoes, squash, zucchini, and cabbage with gravy. Each plate had the names of John's children scrawled on a piece of torn paper next to them. And the meat that she had cooked and served for them was meat from their father. She had cooked his buttocks area literally like a roast. And although she would not comment on it, it is believed that she tried to eat it, but for whatever reason, she couldn't and threw it out in a rage out the back door. There was also a large pot on top of the stove, and when the officers pulled up the lid, they saw John's skinned head cooking almost like a stew with a bunch of vegetables. Some of the responding officers will never eat meat again. So when she is stabilized and questioned, she would deny any recollection of what she did. She was placed in a psychiatric hospital at first and would end up pleading guilty to the murder. The judge would sentence her to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She would be the first woman in Australian history to receive this sentence. She did try to appeal the sentence in 2006, stating that it was too severe of a judgment, but this plea was dismissed. Apparently, she is known as the Nana at Silverwater's Women's Correctional Center in Western Sydney, although she isn't allowed a cellmate in case she kills again. She has since found religion and knits and paints and is an incredible artist, apparently. She even has a job in the prison's factory making headphones. It's a tedious job, but it's said that she gets through more work than anyone else there, and she commands top wage and takes pride in it. So there's that. She is also said to help fellow inmates solve their disputes. She is not allowed around knives or to work in the kitchen. She has never been violent in prison, Yet she still commands a similar respect, which is thought to be because of the sheer just brutality of what she did to John. So now let's look at Catherine's life a little bit because she has a very interesting backstory. She was born on October 24th, 1955 in New South Wales. She was born into a somewhat chaotic situation herself. Her mother, Barbara, was married with four children when she met Catherine's father, Ken. Barbie and Ken. Anyways, the two started an affair, which ended up breaking up Barbara's marriage. At this point, she sent two of her children to live with their father and two to live with an aunt in Sydney. So she started fresh with Ken and ended up having four more children. Ken was a violent alcoholic and he would rape Catherine's mother sometimes up to 10 times a day. On top of this, although he never sexually abused Catherine, she would claim that she was sexually abused by a few other family members until around when she was 11. Her mother would also reportedly complain to her and her sister about their father, but not in an appropriate manner. Apparently, she would get into the intimate details of their relationship with her young daughters, which is inappropriate to begin with, but even worse considering the situation that she was in. Catherine was remembered as being a bully at her school, but at the same time also a model student with good behavior when she wasn't domineering other children. She would leave school when she was 15 without learning to read or write, so I'm not really sure where that model student report is coming from, but I did read it in a couple different reports, so. 
Anyhow, when she left, she started working in a clothing factory, and then her father, Ken, was also an abattoir, and when Catherine was 16, she would join her father along with her sister and one of her brothers to help him skinning the animal carcasses. She apparently got really good at it and was said to really enjoy it. And so she was quickly promoted at the butcher shop and given her own set of butcher's knives, which she ended up hanging over her bed and her reason in case she ever needed them. She would continue this habit in every house that she lived in. Now, let's go over some of Catherine's more significant relationships before she met and murdered John Price. In 1973, she met and fell in love with a coworker named David Kellett. Kellett was also an alcoholic and had a few tragic events in his own life that occurred while working for the railways that ultimately led him to lose his job there and start working at the Aberdeen Avatar shop with Catherine. When the two started dating, Catherine would start to back him up in fights that he would get into, but he quickly learned that she could more than hold her own. The pair would marry in 1974, and when they arrived on a motorcycle that David was driving in a drunken state, Catherine's mother, Barbara, would go up to him, not to talk about him pulling into the wedding with her daughter on the back of his bike drunk. No, not that. She said, and I quote, you better watch this one. She'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of cheating on her. She'll fucking kill you. She's got a screw loose somewhere. <laughs> Can you imagine? Anyhow, they end up getting married anyways. And that very night, Catherine tries to strangle David. And why? <laughs> because he only had sex with her three times before passing out. Apparently, from her mother's inappropriate sharing, she learned that her mother had sex with her father six or more times on their wedding night and took David's three times to mean that he just, I don't know, wasn't as into her as he should be. So, so she tried to strangle him. Other incidents would occur in the household. One time David returned late from a darts competition because his team had made it to the finals. Catherine burned his clothes and shoes. And then when he got home, she would wail him over the head with a frying pan. And it was so bad he ended up being treated for a broken skull. She was pregnant at the time and would give birth to their daughter, Melissa, in 1976, shortly after David would attempt to leave her. When this happened, something really snapped in Catherine because she would take their daughter and lay her down in the middle of the railway and just leave her there to get run over by a train. Luckily, a homeless man found little Melissa and saved her just minutes before a train passed over her. Her mother, Catherine, had left her there to die and went into town, stole an axe, and started swinging it around, threatening people. She was arrested and taken to the hospital, but was actually allowed to sign herself out the next day. Her daughter, Melissa, would be placed with her grandparents, Ken and Barbara. Then a few days later, she would attack a woman with a knife, slashing her in the face and basically carjacking her, demanding that she drive her to Queensland to find her husband. They had to stop at a service station and the young woman ended up escaping, but in a panic, Catherine grabbed a young boy and held him at night point. Police showed up and disarmed her by attacking her with brooms. Apparently this endeavor was an attempt to get the mechanic who had fixed her husband's car up so that she could kill him because he fixed her husband's car. 
and her husband used the car to leave her. <sighs> so after this incident, David actually left his girlfriend and went back to Catherine. He brought his mother along with him for help, and he moved Catherine and Melissa back in with them. And in 1980, they would have another daughter together. Things were just as turbulent at home, though, with Catherine's violent outbursts becoming more and more frequent. Then in 1984, out of nowhere, David would come home from work and Catherine and his daughters would be gone. She would move back in with her mother before a back injury would cause her to be unable to work and she would end up in government housing. Two years later, she would meet another man named David. David Saunders was a minor who also liked to drink. Catherine and Dave would each keep their own apartments, which would cause issues sometimes as Catherine would constantly violently accuse him of cheating. In one particular gruesome fight between the couple, she grabbed his two-month-old puppy and just slit its little throat right in front of him and told him that would be his fate if he ever cheated. Then she knocked him out with a frying pan. Despite all of this, the couple would stay together and have another daughter who they would name Sarah. When this happened, the couple would actually buy a house together in 1989, which Catherine would end up decorating mostly with dead animals. Taxidermy everywhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, this didn't calm her down all that much, and Dave ended up fleeing from the house and the relationship after another particularly bad evening where Catherine smashed him in the head with an iron and then stabbed him with scissors and then also cut up all of his clothing. When he fled, his friends kind of hid him from her for a few months, but while he was gone, Catherine took out a restraining order on him and in the meantime, went on to find another man who also worked in the meat factories, John Chillingworth. And this is the John that Catherine would have her son Eric with. And after three years together, she would leave him for John Price. So yeah, that's a whole lot of insane information. I know. <laughs> Another interesting component to this case is that Catherine's sister was a twin sister. Now, twins are always interesting, especially in crime cases, because they help us to look at these issues from the nature or nurture standpoint. So Joy Knight was raised up along with Catherine and went through the same chaotic upbringing right down to working at the meat factory with her. Yeah, Catherine definitely had something inside of her that was more volatile, ultimately deadly. So it's just amazing to me how many terrible incidences occurred here before the grizzly murder. And with basically no end result, like she just kept going. Which also brings up the issue of domestic violence against males and the stigmas that are attached to that. And it's out there. Not everyone is as deranged as Miss Catherine over here was. Sometimes the more subtle it is, though, the harder it is to really know that it's there. So if you're out there and you think you could be experiencing domestic violence, start by talking to someone if nothing else feels right. Find someone you can trust and talk to them. Or if you don't have someone or feel more comfortable reaching out to a hotline, do that and tell them what's going on. Usually they can tell you if you are experiencing domestic violence and how you can get help. So that is going to do it. But as always, we're going to try to end today on a more positive note. We're going to talk a tiny bit more about domestic violence against men. Now, this issue is an interesting one, especially with all the stigmas attached, especially in male-female relationships, where the man is supposed to be the strong one. As a result, many men are ashamed or scared to report being abused. 
And domestic abuse doesn't always have to be physical. Some examples of non-physical abuse are verbal, psychological, and financial. The good news is that more and more men come forward with their stories and it gives others the courage to do so as well. And in some instances, it gives people the, ooh, aha moment. That's what's happening to me. So if you think you need help, there are so many resources out there. I will leave a few specific links in the info here to get you started. If you're wondering if it's time to get out, Yes, it is. And until next time, stay safe out there. Bye.